Wow, we're in the, the week that changed the world. We are here the next three days. Actually, today is the last day of Lent. Did you know that? Tomorrow starts a new season. And it's the shortest season in the church, the Easter Triduum. And it goes from Holy Thursday night, Holy Saturday, uh, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. Three days. Then we enter a brand new season, and that's quite exciting. That's Easter, and that goes for 40 days. So this is a very, this is quite beautiful to be able to speak about this topic tonight. And there's so much to say about this topic. It, this is the day, Good Friday, that changed the world. This is the person that split time, literally. We actually say it's 2024 because 2024 years ago, and those who want to argue within four years, close enough, 2024 years ago, a baby was born in Bethlehem. Not any baby, but the King of Kings, the creator of the universe. And he came for one mission, and that's to die for us. But for a reason, not just, just to, to save us. We, we say that, we roll it off our tongue. I really hope we appreciate what Jesus has done for us at the end of this talk. May we know the gravity of not only our sin, but the awesome love that God has for us and what he did on that cross. Jesus doesn't just tell us what to do. As a true loving God and a true leader, he shows us what to do. And we're going we're gonna to say, just when you thought everything happens up to the cross and is down and out, he's got a lot more things to do in the last three hours while he's on the cross. And they're called the seven last sayings of Jesus. So are you ready for the journey? You may have had so many Good Fridays in your life and you've gone and you've, you may have meditated on the mystery of the sorrowful mysteries or done stations of the cross and you get up to this station and Jesus carries the cross and you know what's going on, you know the 14 stations. Then Jesus is nailed to the cross and we know what goes on there, he's nailed and that's really hard to deal with. And then he's hung on the cross. Let's just understand very quickly, Jesus, you have to understand, so from Holy Thursday night up until this point, he's got the Last Supper, which is also known as the Passover, the final Passover. Remember the first Passover? The first Passover where they had to kill a lamb, they had to get an unblemished lamb, not break its bones. They had to sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the doorposts with a, with a hyssop branch. Then they had to eat the lamb. And if they did not eat the lamb, this was the final plague in, in, with Moses and Pharaoh, then the firstborn child would be dead. But if they did that, then the angel of darkness at middle of the night will pass over that house. So year after year after year, the Jewish people would celebrate the Passover. And now here we are at the last Passover. And Jesus says this, he gets the bread, he breaks the bread, and he says, this is my body given up for you. And he breaks the bread. So he's calling the bread his body. The apostles must be thinking, excuse me, what, what, what are you, the bread, your body? Where's the lamb? Did you notice none of the gospels talk about the lamb in the last supper? Because Jesus is the lamb. And he breaks the bread, his body, for you and me and those apostles. And he's foreshadowing what's about to take place in about 16 hours' time. He's about to give up everything for us. So they're still not understanding what's going on. So you notice then he drinks uh, three cups of wine. And then it very abruptly goes into the Gethsemane scene. And then he's in the garden. And, and they say that the suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane was worse than actually carrying the cross, was worse than being nailed to the cross. Because in the garden he was sweating blood, literally sweating blood, and, and he knew what was ahead of him. And he says, Father, take this cup away from me, but not my will, thy will be done. And that's the key for us, by the way. When you have hardships in life, when you face t turmoil, when you think that life is so difficult you can't, ha can't handle it, you turn to God the Father and you say, not my will, thy will be done. And we say that in the Our Father every single day. So let's not take those words for granted. Thy will be done. Not my will be done, thy will be done. That's his will. 
And Jesus models that for us. Then he gets back up. You remember the Passion of Christ movie? I love the scene. If you've, has everyone seen it? It's, and if you haven't, I recommend it. The opening scene, Jesus is there. And you notice he, it looks like he's, he's, he's really struggling. He's, he's carrying a burden on his back. He's carrying all our sins, by the way. All the sins in the past and all the sins that will be committed in the future. He's carrying it on his back right now. And he, he sees all of it. And the reason why this is so hard is because he knows we're not going to appreciate it. He knows we're going to turn our back on him. He knows we're going to reject him. He knows we're not going to understand what's going on here. We're, not going to take, we're going to take all of this for granted. This is the creator of the universe we're talking about. He did not have to create us, by the way, but he chose to create us out of love. And here we are. But then there's the, the, you, you see there was the, the image of the devil on the side. And he's looking at it, and the devil thinks he's got him. And he's trying to tempt him. You can't do this. You can't carry the world on your shoulders. And the devil's getting into his ear. And then eventually he gets back up. And then he looks him in the eye. I love that scene. And then he looks down. There's a little snake. And then he stabs on the, he stabs, he stands on the snake, squashes the head. Does that remind you of something? It takes you straight back to where? Old Testament. Genesis 3.15 where God, after the original sin, he says to the serpent, a serpent, snake, I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. She will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. So this is the crushing of the head of the serpent, right there in Gethsemane. So now Jesus, he knows what to do. Now, it continues. At the end of the Garden of Gethsemane, very interesting, it says, after, after three attempts of praying for an hour, coming back to the apostles, and could you not watch one hour with me? The, the, the hour has come, and they were asleep. But then it says, at the darkest hour, the betrayer comes. Who's that? Judas. Darkest hour. Have we heard that before? Where? Exodus. At the darkest hour is midnight. At the stroke of midnight, remember, I just said, the Passover, the angel of darkness will come. And when the angel of darkness comes at midnight, the darkest hour, and he sees the blood on the doorpost, he will pass over that home. So remember that. But now his betrayer comes, kisses him. You betray the Son of Man with a kiss. Do it, do it, do it quickly. Anyway, he does, and here's what I love. The, the soldiers... Jesus says, who are you looking for? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. And if you read the Gospel of John, he says, Yahweh, I am he. Oof. Do we know what that means? Back to Genesis, uh, back to Exodus. God reveals his name as what? I am. And he, Jesus, is saying the powerful name of God, the forbidden name of God. I am Yahweh. And, the, and power came out of him and the soldiers fell. Did you read that part? Do you remember that part? We gloss over it. Gospel of John, read it tonight. The soldiers fell to the ground and they're thinking, what just happened? They finally get back up and you remember the other soldier um, is there. Peter grabs the dagger and he, and he cuts the ear off. And then Jesus actually heals the ear. Another little miracle. So we just gloss over this and we're not realizing Jesus is performing miracles just as he's getting arrested. He's still forgiving and he's still, he's still healing He's performing, he's still loving. You're seeing what's going on here. Now, they're spitting on him, they're bashing him. They're, we know what he went. He didn't sleep that night. How do I know that? I've been to the place where Jesus was, was tied up for the night. So after, remember at, in the night, that he was very sneaky. Those were very sneaky, the Sanhedrin and the church leaders. The, they uh, wanted to arrest him at night and get him to admit that he is the is the so-called son of God. They wanted to hear it for their own words. And he did. He eventually did. Anyway, they ripped their garments and all of that. But they lock him up in a little cell downstairs in a dungeon and they chain him like this. And he, there he is all night. Like that. All night. So we forget. On Holy Thursday night to the early, to the sunrise, so the darkest hour is midnight, he gets, he gets judged there and then he's got to stay up all night like this after being battered and bruised and spat on, right? Then finally, sunrise. 
He goes to Pilate. Pilate doesn't want anything to do with it. I see no guilt in the man. We know all that. I'm not going to spend too much time here. But then goes back, goes to Herod. Herod was a laughing stock. Jesus didn't even speak to him. Did you notice? Then he comes back to Pilate. And what I love about Pilate, he thinks, he says, let's scourge the man. Let's just punish him, scourge him. And so he gets scourged. And it is said that the scourging almost killed him. I don't know if you realize this, but the original scourging was, was rods. And you would you'd get 40 lashes normally. Normally on the back of your legs or on your back. They did 80 of them. And then I think it was up to 120. That's just with the rod. Now, if you've seen the Passion of Christ, you remember that? Again, it looked like he was gone. But then he remembered his mission and he got back up. Got back up. And the soldiers are like, is he for real? And then they get the scourge. This is a chain with bones and metal and all sorts of things that when you, when you lash someone, it rips their flesh. Now, we're not talking about one lash. We're not talking about 40 lashes. We're not talking about 100. Over 300 lashes with this. Not just on the back. The back of his legs, back of his head, front, on his face, on his shoulders, on the front, front, from top to bottom, Jesus was scourged. We know this because the burial cloth of Jesus has all the markings, front and back. So they almost killed him at the scourging. Then you would know the crowning with thorns, which those thorns were nothing small. They were as longer than my finger. They were good 10, 12, 15 centimetres, some of them. Pushed into his head, penetrating his skull. That alone would have not just given him a headache. Next time we complain about a headache, let's think of this. That would have concussed him because they then struck him in the head, pressing those... those and, and, the, and the crown of thorns, we might be tempted to think it's just around here. It's actually a full crown. So it covers the side, the top. I got to see a replica of it. And when they hit him on the head with it, with the rod, pushing that in, he should have been dead. Goes back, and they, then they mock him, right? They're mocking the king of kings, the true king of kings. Hail the king. This is the, uh, the third... Sorrowful mystery, if you're praying your rosary, or it's in the, in the scriptures. And then he's presented to Pilate. Pilate's like, I did not want you to kill him. What are you doing? I just wanted you to teach him a, a small lesson and let him go away. But oh, they couldn't recognize him. Just from the scourging. That scourging scene in the Passion is pretty moving. It brings you to tears. If you haven't watched it, watch it. And actually watch it. And let it, let it shake you. Because that's, that's, that's what happened. So you, and, that, and apparently Mel Gibson held back there, but anyway. Um, but Pilate says, okay, I've got an idea. I need to release this innocent man. All right, I'll get the worst criminal, and I'll, I'm going to say, I'm going to let them decide. I'm going to bring Barabbas. He's one of the worst criminals. And I'll, every year I release one criminal. So let's put Barabbas. You don't get worse than him. And then Jesus. And they say, he says, who would you like to release? Barabbas, a murderer, this man was rough as guts. This, is, this man was trouble. Or Jesus, this innocent lamb, this innocent man who did nothing wrong. They're shouting at the top of their lungs, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And Pilate's still confused. You people are crazy. What, what has he done? And he... And here's the thing, Barabbas did not deserve to be released. He was the worst of all criminals and they wanted him to go and he gets released. And the most innocent man on the planet that has ever lived in human history is condemned to death. That should make you angry. That should make you shaking. That should shake you so, so much that that is not just. And it's not. It should shake you to your bones that Barabbas got released and the most innocent of innocents is condemned until you realize who is Barabbas representing? Barabbas isn't just a criminal. He's representing us. How do I know this? I'm going to say the, the word slowly. 
and there's probably 50% of this crowd that know what this means. Bar Abba. Bar Abba. That's his name. Bar Abba. Bar Abba. What is Abba? Father. What is Bar? How do you know that? We hear in Matthew, remember when we say Simon Bar Jonah? It's actually in English, I don't know why. Simon Bar Jonah. It should say Simon son of Jonah. But they leave the word Bar. There's a clue. Simon Bar Jonah. Bar. Son of. Son of the Father. Barabbas, his name literally means son of the Father. Jesus Christ literally is the son of the Father. And now we have two sons of the Father side by side. One is guilty, one is innocent. And the guilty one is set free. Who is Barabbas? It's me. And it's you. It's us. We are the guilty ones. And Jesus has set us free. That's what this means. That's what this is all about. We deserve death. We deserve punishment. But He has saved us. Why do we deserve punishment, by the way? You need to understand the gravity of this. And I'll end on this and I'm going to go into the seven last things. It's important we understand to appreciate what this loving God of ours has done. Remember that original sin? Remember that original sin? Remember the eating of the apple? It wasn't an apple. <laughs> you know, I tell people all the time, it doesn't say apple anywhere, but it's, it's a forbidden fruit. But when you eat that forbidden fruit, there's nothing wrong with fruit. I encourage you to eat lots of fruit, especially those on the keto diet. Eat fruit. Don't worry about the natural sugar. It's natural. Anyway, <laughs> um, fruit is not bad, but God had to. He had to test us to see if we love him. You don't have love without freedom. No freedom, no love. If there's no opportunity to reject God, this whole existence thing is a waste of time. He makes us out of love for one reason, to love him back. And that's it. Don't complicate this life. We just have to return the love back to the Father. That's it. But we abuse that freedom. And then remember that serpent, that, that, that sneaky serpent, convinced Eve that she will be like God. And that's been the game plan all along. The devil doesn't say to you, pick me, pick me, don't pick God, pick me. He's not like that. Pick yourself. This, that's how he plays the game. It's not that devil here, God here. No. God was saying, pick me, don't pick the devil. It's pick me, don't pick yourself. We become our own gods. And this has been the game plan from day one. And this is how the devil has won out there. What's the message we're getting out there? Me, myself and I. You don't need God. Just yourself. How many times has that happened? I remember in primary school. I don't know if they do it at this primary school, but I know in, when I was in primary school, the teachers asked us, who is the most important person in the world? And the kids will answer, who? The kids will answer God. They're more intelligent than the teachers sometimes because the teachers then say, no, that's wrong. Excuse me, miss. The most important person in the world is you. We're getting that so wrong. We're getting it so wrong. We are the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. And the devil, from day one, has turned our focus on ourselves. He started with Adam and Eve, and he did that to them. But this is where we have to realize we needed the freedom. If we don't have freedom, we don't have love. I hope you get that. No freedom, no purpose. No freedom, we don't need to exist. God did not create robots or zombies. He created a free loving beings that all we have to do is freely choose him. If we don't have freedom, there is no love. Just remember that. But now the consequence of sin. So now when you cut yourself from God, I want you to understand the gravity here very quickly. I, I'll use this example. It's the simplest one I know. If I was to insult our friend Anthony over here, and I say, said something, I shouldn't have insulted you. What's the punishment? Apologize. Then he forgives me. You say sorry. I say sorry. You forgive me. We're good. One on one. 
But if I was to do the same insult to Father, it's a little bit worse, isn't it? He's the same human being like you, but something is different about Father. He represents the church, but the parish as well, right? So, sorry is not going to cut it. Maybe I need to go to confession. Maybe I need to up the ante a bit. Maybe I need to apologise to the community. What about if I insulted the same insult to a police officer out there on my way home? Just the same word I said to you. What will then happen? Maybe I have to pay a fine. Excuse me, sir, step out of the car. Insulting a police officer, here's your $250 fine. If I did the same insult to the Prime Minister, now I know today, these days, we, we insult the Prime Minister all the time, but we shouldn't be. <laughs> but if I did, what would be the punishment? Probably parole, jail time, community service, something a bit more dramatic. dramatic. What about if I did the same insult to a king, King Charles? Okay, people are insulting, I know, but what would be the punishment? Not just jail, sometimes death. It's happened in our history. What is going on? Every atheist can agree with this. On a natural level, when I insult you, and the same insult to Father, and the same insult to the police officer, and the same insult to the Prime Minister, then the King or the Queen, the punishment gets worse because you can measure the impact of that. Between you and me, it's just you and me. Me and Father is now the community. The police officer represents the state. Prime Minister represents the country. The king or the queen represent the kingdom. Do you see how it works? The punishment must fit the crime. We agree on that? What about if you insult God? How do I measure that? Does he represent the world? No. The universe? He represents infinity, eternity. There's no beginning and there's no end. There's no start, there's no finish. God is immeasurable. So how on earth can we measure the punishment deserving? We can't. It wasn't as if Adam says to God, Hey Adam, a uh God, we're both really sorry. Take my wife, uh, keep my wife, take me and save my wife. God would have said, Thank you, Adam, but I don't think you realize the gravity of what you've just done here. You've cut yourself from me. The only way this can be reconciled now is if somehow, miraculously, an infinite person could represent us finite beings. Do you see the game plan now? The good news is we actually have an infinite person, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Jesus Christ comes down and becomes one of us and he unites the two. He's 100% God, 100% man. And he died. Representing God, infinity, eternity, paying the price we could never pay. And ourselves. Do you see how this works? Next time you see a crucifix, be so grateful for what he has done for us. Because he did not have to do it. It could have been over back then. <laughs> but he's come back. And by the way, it, it took so long, not because God wasn't ready. He is always, always ready. It was because we weren't ready. Proof, the next generation. After Adam and Eve, Cain kills Abel. And the rest of the Old Testament, we're seeing more murders and more adultery and more sin. And it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And, and we have the Egyptians, we have the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and finally the Romans. And we realize God waited till this moment in time for two reasons. One, I don't know if you read the last book of the Old Testament, Maccabees, but finally the Jewish people stood up for Yahweh to the point where they, had, they re-consecrated their temple, and that's called Hanukkah, the Jewish feast today, and it's in the book of Maccabees. Read that. So they were so persecuted, but then they stood up for the one true God. So finally... They, so they found their faith. Remember, the whole Old Testament is them losing their faith, turning to pagan worship. They finally stood their ground. And then under the Roman Empire, communication 
was much easier to spread. So in this setting, Jesus comes into the world. And by the way, who's the leader of the time? We've got Julius Caesar. He dies. He thinks of himself as a god. Then Caesar Augustus, the son of God. So at the same time, you have one son of God, supposedly, and the real son of God at the same time. Beautiful. But now we come back to the cross. Jesus is asked to carry the cross. And if you've been there, he goes up a mountain, Mount Calvary, and he gets to the top. And I encourage you, especially on Good Friday, but the stations of the cross and follow them. He gets nailed to the cross. Now, just a little comparison here. It's a fulfillment of, of lots of things in the Old Testament, but just one that you might be familiar with. Jesus is the, is the Son of God, the Son of the Father. God the Father loved us so much that he sent down his Son to die for us. And he went up Mount Calvary carrying wood on his back to his own death. I want you to rewind. Some of you who know the Old Testament, who studied with me. In Genesis, Abraham is asked to sacrifice his son Isaac, his beloved son, up a mountain, Mount Moriah, with wood on his back. And he says, where's, where's the lamb? And he says, God will provide the lamb. And he gets to the top, about to kill his son, and the angel stops him. And then there's a ram with its head in the sickle, the bushes, actually the same bush that was made like the crown of thorns that Jesus wore. Interesting. But do you see the parallel? Isaac is the son of Abraham, the father, who will be taken up the mountain with wood on his back to his own death. And God is supposed to provide the lamb. Jesus is the son of the father going up a mountain, Mount Calvary, with wood on his back, the cross, and he will go to his own death. But he doesn't get a lamb. He is the lamb. The lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. See the difference. He fulfills perfectly that Old Testament story. This is happening throughout the Bible. But here we are. He's now nailed through his hands, the base of his hands. Not, not up here and not down here. It's actually for the base of the palm. And it comes in this way. So it was enough to hold excruciating pain. I don't know if you also realize, if I press on this nerve, my thumb comes in. You can actually try it. You press on the nerve right in the wrist and your thumb naturally comes in. Why am I saying that? Right in there is, is the medial nerve. It's, it's the most painful part you can pierce. So Jesus would have went to the base of the palm and hitting that medial nerve right through. And it causing his killing this nerve here, the thumb would have been like this. We've discovered in the Shroud of Turin, Jesus is like this. In the burial cloth, the thumbs are in. Just all these little details that confirm the way things have been in the scriptures. So he's hanging, now he's, he's now lifted up on the cross for the world to see. If you read the Old Testament again, you'll realize this is a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. Daniel 7, the Son of Man will be lifted up for the world to see. And here he is. They're using the same words. It, it, the, the Gospel writers are deliberately linking us back to the Old Testament, deliberately showing the Jewish people that this is the Messiah you've been waiting for. So he's now lifted up. And just when you think it's over, he's not done. He's about to give the greatest sermon ever told from a cross. He can't even breathe. The only way he could breathe is pressing on his feet on the cross to lift up for a few seconds to grasp, grasp some air and say a few words. This is the in, most innocent man that ever lived, being battered and bruised and scourged, mocked, spat on, crowned with thorns. They nailed him. And what are the first words that come out of his mouth? on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Ouch! If there's any a time when Jesus could actually have justice here. Jesus, what are you doing? You could, these guys, don't let them get away with it. They deserve what's coming. Don't let these guys get away with it. 
They've just nailed you. They're about to kill the most innocent man that ever lived. But no, he came for this reason. And he's modelling as a leader what he wants from us to forgive. You see, forgiveness isn't just a nice suggestion. Forgiveness is a requirement, a requirement for you to be forgiven. Do you know how powerful that is? Do you know how important that is? This is very, this is, I'm only on the first saying, by the way, but here we go. If you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. That's what, that's what's saying, that's what's going on here. Remember the Our Father? Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If you are not willing to forgive, how could you expect God to forgive you? And here Jesus is saying, forgive. When it hurts the most, he's going through the most excruciating pain, not just physically, emotionally, every type of pain you can think of, he carried it right there. And he now forgives. And he says it out loud. And then he says, he's interceding for them. I want to link back just very importantly here that if, the, if Jesus says forgive and we need to forgive, that was his first word, his first statement on the cross. Do you remember his first statement in the, in the public? Um, a little clue, it's the third luminous mystery, those who pray the rosary, third luminous mystery. What's the clue? Proclamation of the kingdom. What does he say? Public words, repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see, if you don't repent, you cannot be forgiven. If you don't repent, you can't start the process of healing. Jesus knows this. Psychologists know this. AA programs know this. If you want to overcome any addiction, if you want to overcome any problems, you must first admit fault. If you want to be healed in this world, you have to admit that I have a problem. Repent. <laughs> and guess what? Once you do that, and that's all that's required for us to enter heaven, by the way, is love God, and if I stuff up, say sorry. Just say sorry. God, have mercy on me. Say sorry. And I go one step further. Remember Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor? It's a package deal. So now we have to love our neighbor. We have to also say sorry to them. Have you hurt anyone in your life? Have you done wrong by anyone in your life? This is the time more than ever to say sorry. It hurts. It humiliates you. It humbles you. And that's the point. And then we can heal from that. But then there's the other part of the coin, right? Forgiveness. If we don't forgive, we cannot be forgiven. So now I'm going to ask the next part. If someone has done wrong to you, don't do what the world says, me, myself, and I, me first, and seek revenge. Do what Jesus has done and forgive. It's hard, isn't it? It's embarrassing. Your reputation is at risk. I mean, all these things that we, we think of, our pride gets hurt. But if we don't forgive, we cannot be forgiven, and we also won't be healed. You see, what we do in our lives is we bury all of these things and we think, oh yeah, I just forget it ever happened. And years later, it comes to hurt us and bite us. The most freeing thing you can do tonight, tomorrow, this Easter Triduum and this Easter, think about all of the things in your life that you've done wrong and to be sorry for them. And think of all of the things that people have done wrong to you and be ready to forgive. Not easy, but that wasn't easy too. That's as hard as it gets. So can we forgive? And I promise you this, this is a, this is a I shouldn't be promising, with your yes should be yes, your no should be no, but I'm going to guarantee this. You will find peace like you've never had in your life if you are sorry and you forgive. And Jesus is modelling this for us. That's the first saying. <laughs> Second saying, do you remember the the uh, two thieves. We have a good thief and a bad thief. Why do we call them good and bad? So there's the bad thief and he's sort of saying, come on Jesus, if you are really who you say you are, save yourself and save us with you. And then the good thief is there, are you serious? Do you know who you're talking to? We are guilty. 
We deserve what's coming. This man is innocent. And the good thief turns to Jesus and he says, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turns to him and he says, Truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. That man got saved because he was sorry. What did he say to the other one? Did he turn to him and say, you're going to hell? What did he say to him? What, I, do you remember what he said? Does anyone know what he said? So he says to this one, today you'll be with me in paradise. And what does he say to the bad one? Do you remember? And it, he said absolutely nothing. And that's the point. May we never be in that position where Jesus doesn't want to talk to you. Oof. <laughs> you see, on Judgment Day, we want to hear those words. Come and enjoy the kingdom, what I've prepared for you. Be with me in paradise. We want Jesus to know our name. We don't want to be this one over here where he doesn't even say a word to you. That's the second saying. Third saying, looks down and he notices his mother and John, the beloved disciple. The beloved disciple, that word is used because he's seen as our model. He's seen as the ultimate disciple. You look at John and you say, whatever John does, I need to imitate John because he's the beloved, the, the disciple that Jesus loved. Remember the way he says it? And here he is and his mother's there. And Jesus is looking down and he sees his mother and he sees John. And of course, at first he's worried his mother's going to be alone now. She's lost St. Joseph, and now she's going to lose me. So he, he, first he talks to John, and he says, John, behold your mother. This is very important. Does he say to Mary, Mary, behold your son? Mother, behold your son? That's what he said, right? I want you to notice very closely, it's even in English, woman. Behold your son. And just when you're thinking, hang on, Charbel, hey, that's very disrespectful. If I said that to my mum, I'm going to get a slap. I, I used to get slaps from my mum, so I know. He's not disrespecting Mary at all. Do you know what he's doing? He's calling her woman, the same woman we first heard about, Genesis 3.15. Remember when God was speaking to the serpent? I'll put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed, and she will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. You see, that woman, women don't have seeds unless she's a virgin. Only one virgin ever lived, Mary, that had a child. She crushes the head of the serpent at the Annunciation when she said yes to the angel and, and Jesus is then in her womb. That's why she's called the Ark of the Covenant. And then the son, the bruising of the son, so we know it's a son, it's the crucifixion. So that, that Old Testament verse 3.15, Genesis 3.15, is foreshadowing this very moment. And now Jesus is linking Mary to that woman and showing us that's the one prophesied from the very beginning. Take note. And she's not just any woman. She's that woman. And she's not just John's mother. She's, not, she's everyone's mother. Because at that point, John, the beloved disciple that we're supposed to imitate, who represents the model disciple, which is us, if that's his mother, she now is our mother. That's not the first time Jesus calls a woman. You know the other time? Wedding feast at Cana. And the other time is in Revelation. The woman crowned with stars, moon under her feet. She's in heaven. So woman in Genesis in John, at the, John 3 or 4, in um, the crucifixion and then Revelation. So you've got four times this woman presented. That, that I know of. There's probably more. That's saying number three. Now four. By the way, each one of these sayings is absolutely exhausting for Jesus to do. And just when you thought he's gone, we're like an hour in. How could he survive this? He's still got more to say. We're not even halfway Fourth saying. I'm going to say this in Aramaic and see if you know what I say in English. Lahi, lahi, lava sabachthani. What does that mean? My God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? And on first experience, you might think Jesus feels abandoned by the Father. You might be thinking, oh wow, there's, there you go, the Father's abandoned Jesus, obviously. And the others are thinking, where is your God now? I thought you are God, Look, what's going on here? That's the first. And if anyone out there is te teaching you, this is the time when Jesus felt abandoned, run away as far as you can. That's not what's going on. That is very bad theology. Jesus has always said, the Father and he are one. Where the Father is, there is Jesus. So how could he be abandoned? He's not abandoned. What is going on? I want to say this literally, and I want to point out some of the, um, the connections. When I say to you this, our Father, just our Father, you would probably, as a Catholic or Christian, continue and say, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. If I say, Hail Mary, as a Catholic, you'll say, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. If I say, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. You know I'm thinking of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures. And you start to continue on to the, onto the psalm. The, the, the Jewish people had to recite the psalms every single day. 150 psalms every single day. Jesus himself did this in the synagogues, he did this every day. And guess what? That tradition continues in the church today. It's called the office, it's called the divine office or the liturgy of the hours. Father does it every day, I can assure you. And everyone else, all the priests and deacons are, are doing it every day. Now they may not do all 150 these days. It's, it's, it's about a, a four week cycle these days. But the, the whole 150 Psalms are being prayed and the Jewish people do it every day. So they know it off by heart. Jesus knows it off by heart. And Jesus knows what he's doing. He wouldn't go through that trouble pushing on his legs to say out loud to everyone, my God's abandoned me. No. He's pushing on his legs, breathing out to saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it continues. Are you ready? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. Psalm 22. Jesus is quoting Psalm 22. And if you read Psalm 22, and I'm going to point out a few points here. Psalm 22 is describing what's happening before their very eyes. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of them who know the Psalms are watching and witnessing this Jewish carpenter who claims to be God on a cross quoting Psalm 22, and they're reciting Psalm 22. I'll just say a few more words, and I want you to think about what's going on in their brain as they see what's happening before their very eyes. Oh, boy. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you did deliver them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. Continues. My, num my bones are numbered. They gloat at me. They strip me. They cast lots on my clothes. They pierce my hands and my feet. Are you serious? This is in the Old Testament, Psalm 22. Read that psalm and you'll notice the majority of that psalm is actually being fulfilled before their very eyes. So Jesus isn't just telling them he's God. He is showing them he is God from their Old Testament. Uh-oh. <laughs> and I believe many of the Jewish people that witnessed it that day converted. Absolutely. Many didn't, the stubborn ones, but many did. And they saw before their very eyes. We're now at the halfway mark. That's saying number four. So remember, Psalm 22. Just take note, on Good Friday, this is recited. We sort of gloss over it. Now I hope you take a bit more notice. Both in the Roman rite, you read the psalm, and I can't remember, it's one of the offices, the Psalm 22 is said, and every fourth Friday of the cycle. And then even in the Maronites, uh, they would say inside of the uh, funeral mass, look out for it, look out for it. Psalm 22 is recited. So you see, our church doesn't just um, accidentally throw scriptures together. It deliberately chooses the right passages 
the Old Testament is linked with the New. The New is linked with the Old. And it's deliberately placing it before us so we can see the links. So please take note. It's deliberate. It's not an accident. Fifth saying, Jesus says, I thirst. On the, on, on the face value, yes, he thirsts for us. He thirsts for our souls. He's thirsting for us to turn to him. Absolutely. But there's something more. In one gospel, they grab a, a, a spear and a sponge, dip it in vinegar and just give it to him and he drinks. In another gospel, they get a hyssop branch and, and dip it in vinegar and he drinks. So it depends which one you're reading. Hyssop branch is not an accident, by the way. What did I say earlier in the talk? The hyssop branch. What was that used for? The Passover, remember that? You had to sprinkle the blood on the doorpost with a hyssop branch. And here we are with a hyssop branch that Jesus has to drink from. Now, what on earth would a little sip do for him at that point? He's doing something deliberate. Let's, let's take note closely. He drinks. And then he says the sixth saying. You ready? It is finished. Now, I want to ask you a very important question. What is finished? This is your chance to call out what is finished. Yes, I'm going to explain that. Someone, knows. anyone else? The new, the old covenant's finished. Yes, but is it finished? Some people might say salvation, like the whole saving part, is finished. Yes, it is, but is there more to go? What more is there to go? If Jesus ended right there, it is finished and died right there, there'll be a problem. We need the resurrection. So what's finished? In the Last Supper, do you remember? How many cups did he drink? How many actual cups are there in the Passover? Four. And what do you say when you drink the fourth cup at the end of the Passover? It is finished. You see, what Jesus is doing, look at it from, the, from his eyes. He's completed the Last Supper the last Passover, on the cross. And now, God's not providing the lamb, he is the lamb. So we've got the hyssop branch, we've got the, the wine, and we've got the, the announcement, it is finished. That is perfectly in line with the Passover. Oof. This is deep. And we need to understand it. Wait till we get to the end. We're not finished yet. This is only saying number six and there's one more to go. Just when you thought Jesus was down and out and it's over, this man has lost. The devil thinks he's won. And Jesus does one last saying, saying number seven. Father, remember the one that was supposed to abandon him? Now we're turning to it. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And he hangs his head and breathes his last. Hangs his head and breathes his last. <sighs> Jesus was not murdered. Did you notice? Jesus was not murdered. He laid down his life on his terms. Did you see that? He should have been dead at the scourging. He should have been gone then. At the crowning of thorns. At the carrying of the cross when he fell down the first time. What about the second time? What about the third time? He should have been dead when he was nailed. But he had seven sayings to go and he had to complete all seven. And you notice what just happened then. And he didn't just get killed. He laid down his life for us. On his terms, when he's ready to go, it's time. I've done it all. It's accomplished. No greater love is there than a man lay down his life for his friend. And here it is. You don't get any greater love than that. That God, the most innocent of all innocents, the most pure of all pure things, God incarnate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe, who has no beginning, who has no end, who loved us so much, that created us out of nothing, we stuffed it up, we rejected him, and he comes down to become one of us, goes through all of this problem, dies on the cross, still forgives us, and now... He's opening the gates of heaven for us. 
He's not, show, he's not just telling us, he's showing us what true love is. You see, the world out there, when it tells you the world, it's, you're, you know, you're the most important person in the world, it's about you, let's play that out. I put myself first. Who's second? Not your family. Not, not these days. It's your friends, because you can choose your friends. You can't choose your family, can you? But then, okay, all right, um, I guess it's my, my siblings or cousins, all right, and parents. Maybe my spouse if I'm, if I'm married, and children. And then, at the very end, if I do go to church, it's God. Isn't that the case? You've heard of this, right? I'm not making this up. I want you to flip that. Because the devil, what does the devil do? He inverts everything good. So, now if God is down here with the world, we're going to flip him back up here. God should be number one. We worship the creator of the universe, not the universe itself. The creator of the universe, the creator of creation. He's number one. Then if I'm married, my spouse. If I'm a priest or a nun, the church, my spouse. So it's God, my spouse, children. Then it's friends or neighbors. And then get ready, me. I put myself last, not first. If I play that out and everyone in here went out there and started putting yourself first, what do we have? Anarchy, chaos. When we love as we should love, we put others first. We let others go before us. We give up our own little desires for other people to, to have something. We always feed the poor, help the sick. We always go out of our way for someone else. That's the Christian way. Never ourself. And Jesus is modeling it for us. That's love. And imagine every single marriage that put the other spouse first. We could save the 50% that we're losing. Imagine everyone did this. What would happen out there? We actually wouldn't need any rules. You don't need a speed limit. You don't need out-of-bounds areas. You don't need anything. You don't need any rules because everyone is loving. But rules are created because of our disobedience, because of our selfishness. Someone speeds, kills someone. Okay, we're going to reduce the speed limit here. Someone is smoking so much so that they're so addicted, okay, we're going to have to put a tax on it because they can't control themselves. Alcohol, people are going out of control. We're going to have to increase the tax to reduce the alcohol limit. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to in, put in more and more rules to keep us in check. Do you see what's going on here? People think to be a saint or to get to heaven, I have to do all my checklist. Little clue. In the very beginning... God had no rule for Adam and Eve, just one. Don't eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Does that sound like a, a God that hates us? Does that sound like a God that is restricting us? No. We're free. We abuse that freedom and then rules start coming in. Murder, envy, jealousy, adultery, stealing. And then we have to get the Ten Commandments. And then the Ten Commandments, which you think that we obey, we break every day. Think about it. So God has shown us what's going on. Now, it's not over yet. Just when you thought, okay, it's over. It's three o'clock. Jesus breathes his last. And it goes dark. Earth, nature, is now mourning with the Creator. Creation is now expressing its sadness. The earth shakes, splits open. The temple split, the curtain in the temple splits. We don't know about the Ark of the Covenant anymore. Interesting. It's an earthquake, it's, it's rumbling, it's, it's looking like it's the end of the day. It's only three o'clock. So very quickly, they need to, they need to make sure that they're, they're dead. So they go up to the first um, uh, thief there, and they break his bones. Because once they break their bones, his bones, he collapses, and that's it. He can't breathe anymore and die. They go to the other one and breaks. They go to Jesus and they notice he's already dead to fulfill the scriptures. An unblemished lamb with no broken bones. Oh, interesting detail. So they get a spear and they pierce him in the side, right through this side, the right side. 
and it goes into the heart, which is on the left side, rips out, and out of his side comes blood and water. Water symbolizing baptism. Blood symbolizing the Eucharist. There's more to it. Out of the side. And the timing is very deliberate. It's at the time when Jesus is dead. He, he gives every drop. He's known as this new Adam. Have you ever heard of that? The new Adam. So why? What happened to the first Adam? Well, the first Adam, when in paradise, remember he was alone and looked around, he saw the animals, and the animals had a male and a female, and they could have babies, and they, could, they were loving, and they were all, he felt alone. And then God put Adam in a deep sleep, and then from the side of Adam, before you jump to conclusions, just took a ribbon, made a spare ribbon. No, it was the side of Adam was his bride, Eve. The new Adam, Jesus Christ, while he's asleep, the side is born something else. His bride, the church, us. We are known as the bride of Christ. He is the head, we are the body. We are the part of the mystical body of Christ. It gets deeper. Because now, when you have everything out there split, water and blood, Jesus on the cross, he's drained every bit of blood. When the last drop of blood is drained, we can conclude life is gone. You're dead. All the animal sacrifices that led up to this, they had to drain the blood, right? Because when you drain the blood, blood symbolized life. So take note, what is going on here? <laughs> Who went to Mass tonight? Who just went to Mass? Okay. Did you notice Father was in, in, in the church, and, he, and you notice how he goes in the sanctuary, which is like the Holy of Holies, and you go into the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, and the altar is, is slightly elevated. Did you notice that? And there's a few steps to the altar. Typically, it's three steps. It's all theological. And you go up, and there's three steps to the altar. The altar, then, is right there. It's symbolizing something. The cross. The cross is an altar. You go up there, and you're on Mount Calvary. You have to know this. You go to the church, Mount Calvary. So the priest goes up to Mount Calvary. And then he says the words Jesus says at the Last Supper. This is my body with the bread, breaks it, given up for you. And at the first elevation, that's the consecration, when God transubstantiates, that bread now becomes his body, blood, soul, and divinity. And just when you think, okay, hold on. Did you just say his blood? Yes. So why have the next part when he gets the chalice and he consecrates that? This is my blood shed for you. Well, hang on. Why do double consecration? Just do one. Why do two? Have you wondered, wondered about that? Why do two? I mean, he did it in the last supper. Let's not, you know, a lot of people might think, oh, let's do it. You know, let's follow what happened last supper. So it's a nice thing. No. Why are there two? Why is there a double consecration in the Mass? Because when you separate blood from flesh, what happens? You have death. You get that? Separate the blood from the flesh, it's death. Did you notice the second part of the elevation? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Do you remember that part in the Mass? Did you notice just before that what the priest does? Anyone notice? Next time you go to Mass, look for this, okay? He breaks a little bit of the, the, the Eucharist and he puts it in the chalice. What's going on? He's reunifying the blood and the flesh. When you reunify flesh and blood, you have life. It's the resurrection. The first elevation, you're at Calvary. The second elevation, it's Easter time. Every single Mass and it gets even better because now the priest who is in persona Christi, the person of Christ, comes down from Calvary, down the steps, meets us at the sanctuary, right there when heaven meets earth, right there, if the priest is representing Jesus, the head of the body, the groom, and we are supposed to be the body of Christ, the bride, and we meet him at the 
threshold of heaven, it's a wedding. The groom and the bride get married. And those who know that the marriage ceremony is not over until the wedding night, literally, it's called the consummation of the marriage, well then we actually do that too. We receive Jesus' body, blood, soul and divinity and he enters into us. We become one with our groom. We become one. This isn't just any sort of marriage we're talking about now. This is the ultimate marriage between God and us. And it happens at every single Mass. Every single Mass. So we're all married <laughs> if you go receive communion. And it's so powerful because you don't get more intimate than this. And I'm wrapping it up now, but how do you get more intimate than becoming food? Not any food, bread and wine. That's deliberate too. Have you noticed? Huh. All the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, every single one of them, it's, it's for atonement of sin, right? So the idea is, remember back at the beginning, Adam could have said to God, I deserve death, take me, save her. Well, God in his mercy said, no, it's okay. I don't need to take it. The substitute will be this animal. Instead of you, Adam, this animal will die in your place. Now, it's not a perfect sacrifice, it's an imperfect sacrifice. But that animal will, will be killed, it's blood drained, you eat the animal, you get to live another day. This is interesting. The animal dies so we could live. And you might be thinking, oh, so that's the, that's the circle of life. The lion eat the hyenas. The whales eat the other fish. The bigger fish eat the smaller fish. The bigger birds eat the smaller birds. It, this is life. This is the circle of life. But it's interesting. To survive a day in this world, in the physical world, you must consume life but it must be dead before you consume it, so I could live. Have you thought about that? Every animal that you eat was alive, and then it died. Now you're both thinking, that's nice for you, Charbel, that's a good example, but I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> Fruit and veg are alive. The seed dies, gets transformed, resurrects into a tree, the tree grows fruit, you take the fruit off the tree, it's taken off the source of life, it's now dead. Now I consume it, so I could live. You see, the animal sacrifices are part of life. And then, this is where we've got to start appreciating what God has done for us. Fruit, vegetables, wheat, breads, all that, it's all alive. Minerals, all of it's alive. And then it dies so we can live. Okay, you got that. The lamb, Jesus becomes that lamb. He is the ultimate sacrifice. You see, the start of his life and the end of his life, the book ends, is to fulfill this old covenant. He is the ultimate sacrifice. Do you know how he got born? In the town of David? Bethlehem. What, what does that mean? Translated? House of bread. House of bread. Bad means house. Lahem, lechem means bread. But in Arabic, can I just say it a little bit? Laham means what? People who speak Arabic? Meat. So in Arabic, it's the house of meat. In Hebrew, it's the house of bread. It's the town of David. Huh. And then he's born in a cave. Not any cave. A cave where animals are in. Not any animals. Not your pet house where the dog stayed. It's the lambs and the goats. It's in the shepherd's field. And the cave has the animals of sacrifice. You see, those animals, the shepherd's job is to prepare the sheep. Then they look after the best ones and they get sold to the temple for the animal sacrifice. Jesus is born in that cave. I had mass there. It's very moving. And he's not just born in a little bassinet you buy from Babies R Us. It's not comfortable. It's a, it's a stone rectangle block. It's a feeding trough. He's our food. So this little baby that's born into the world becomes our food. In the house of bread, the house of meat. 
among the animals of sacrifice. This is the Lamb of God. If you want to go a little bit further, the three kings, they give him gold, frankincense and myrrh. Gold for his kingship. Frankincense for his divinity. Myrrh for his death. This is the only time we see someone enter into the world given something that it for his death. That's his mission. And now we fast forward to the death. He now fulfills all of these. He becomes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And if you read the book of Revelation, count how many times Jesus or God is called the Lamb. It's about 22 times. And notice when you read the book of Gen uh, Revelation, it is not the doom and the gloom of the end of the world. Be very careful. It's what's happening at the end of time, meaning in heaven, the new Jerusalem. Do you see what's going on? I recommend you read The Lamb's Supper by Scott Hahn. Brilliant. And he goes into what the book of Revelation is. And lamb, 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 lamb. Jesus is the real Lamb of God. He is our food. He's the new manna from heaven, and he, wants, he loves us so much. God loved us so much. He didn't just die for us. He didn't just open the gates of heaven for us, but he becomes our food. And one last thing as you enter into this three days in the triduum. He descends into Hades. And guess what happens at this point? He, he now brings up all of those Old Testament prophets. Adam... Rise, Adam, rise. It's time. You get to enjoy heaven. Rise, Abraham, rise. Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Aaron, rise. King David, rise. It is your time. You were held in the holding place for so long. 4,000 years you've been waiting for this moment. And here I am, your creator. I've done it. The mission is accomplished. Let's go. And he lifts them up. And as he lifts them up, he puts them in heaven and he rises at the same time. Sunday morning. How do we count the three days? They wanted to take his body down from the cross before the sunset. Now, it's sort of sunset a bit early that day, but it was just the clouds covering. But at sunset is when the Sabbath starts. So the Jewish Sabbath starts at sunset Friday. So that's day one. Sunset Friday goes all the way, all night, and it goes to sunrise Saturday, day one. Sunrise Saturday goes all the way to sunset Saturday, day two. Sunset Saturday goes all the way to sunrise Sunday, day three. And so we've got, remember the greater um, light to rule the day, the sun, the lesser light to rule the night, the moon. So you've got these days. And that's how you count three days. And on that third day, Jesus rises. And one last story out of all of that, there's lots of them where he appears and he disappears and all that. But there's one story where they thought he was a gardener. That's deliberate, because Adam was supposed to protect the garden. And here comes Jesus, the new Adam, a gardener. And they, they didn't recognize him. And then they, and he was just talking to them, what, what's going on? And they said, haven't you heard Jesus of Nazareth was murdered? And then the tomb is empty. Have you not heard any of this? Have you been under a rock? Uh, actually, he was. But have you, what? And Jesus says, all the Old Testament stories to them. And he's journeying to the road to Emmaus and he tells them all the Old Testament stories. And then they say this, they admit the apostles, weren't our hearts burning when he was there? Because he was saying the best Bible study you would ever get from anyone. And then he gets there and then at the breaking of the bread, the first mass, they realize who he was. They recognize, you're not the gar a gardener, you are Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It was the first day of the week. We know that's a Sunday. That's why Mass is now celebrated on Sunday. Sunday, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. That's why Sabbath moves from the seventh day to the eighth day. That's right. Seventh day to the eighth day, not the first day. We worship on the eighth day. Do you know what eight means? It's the Jewish term for eight. It's eternity. Eight has no beginning, no end. I don't know if this is real, but you know those video games that have the, the infinity sign? I don't know if that's real, but it's a sideways eight. But anyway, eight means eternity, because when you count your days, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven means completion. It's not that he's going back to day one. He's going to the next day. Eight, eternity. 
And that's why in the church, when Easter Sunday starts, we actually have eight days of Easter. Did you know that? Easter Monday, Easter Tuesday, Easter Wednesday, Easter Thursday, Easter Friday, Easter Saturday, Easter Sunday, part two. That's Divine Mercy Sunday. Eight days, it's exactly the same. One block. Are the readings the same every day as well? No, they're different, but it's celebrated exactly the same. It's a solemnity. It is Easter. So I would say, Happy Easter, Happy Easter. Christ is risen, he's truly risen in that eight day. But Jesus stays on earth for how many days? 40. Remember 40? It's new life. New life. 40 means new life. A mother is pregnant for 40 weeks from conception to birth. 40 weeks, new life. 40 days, 40 nights, the flood. Washing away of sin, new life. 40 years in the wilderness, new life. That's where you get to the promised land. 40 days in the desert, at the end of it, overcomes it, ready, new life. New life, new life, new life. 40, 40, 40. We've just now completed 40. Lent. Let's begin our new life. And then Jesus, um, and then he says, I'll send my comforter. Nine days later, the first novena, he sends, he goes up to heaven, ascension. And then nine days later, we have the Holy Spirit come down and the Holy Spirit fills the apostles and then they go out and preach and make disciples of all nations. And then they mimic and imitate Jesus Christ. And this is the point of the whole thing. Jesus didn't just come to show us. He didn't just come to save us. But he's also asking us one last thing, to do what he did. That means to love. See, anyone who, who says we are saved by faith alone, only, no. It's faith and action, love. Otherwise, you can talk the talk all you want. Are we ready to walk the walk? And that is true love. And that's what we're called to. So are we ready to die? That's what we're called to, for God for the truth in a world that unfortunately doesn't want to hear it. But it's the very thing they need. It's the very thing they're starving for. And it's up to us to share it. And if we don't share it, who's going to give it to them? So God could come down and infuse knowledge to everyone. But no, he needs us to freely choose him. So it's up to us to freely serve him and to freely share the truth. God bless you. Um, can I do some Q&A? Yes. Uh, what do you mean is the free yes, the good question. Why does God need us to freely choose him? If there's no freedom, there is no love. Have you ever heard this? Has anyone heard this? It's a great question. If there's a God, why is there evil in the world? If there is a God, why doesn't he stop all the murders and the killings? If there's a God, why, why is there problems and suffering and all that? Why, why would a loving God do all this? I would say to you this. If there was no, if everyone was perfect, this whole creation thing is a complete waste of time. Thank you. It's a complete waste of time if we were all made perfect. What are you talking about, Shabal? Because if we were perfect, it means, and we have no chance of denying God, it means we're not free. It means we are robots, zombies, we're slaves, we're puppets. Have you thought of that? And if we're puppets, I think God's got better things to do than just play games. I'm not joking. If there's no possibility of rejecting God, there is no possibility to love. And if there's no possibility to love, there is no purpose in this existence at all. To every atheist out there, if you think that making everyone perfect is going to solve your problems and make God unexist, that's not true. Amen. So let me give you an example. I have to do this example. The, the two very basic ones, but I think it drums home the point. The first one is freedom. Um, and you might know this, some of you. The Pinocchio story where the, where the carpenter, he wants a son. And he can't have a son, but he's, uh, he's a carpenter. So he makes himself a puppet out of wood. And he puts strings on this puppet, on the hands, on the feet. And he moves Pinocchio around. Oh, I have a son, I have a son. And he moves him anywhere he wants. And when he's finished with him, he lays him down. 
But it's so sad because Pinocchio is just a lump of wood. I want a real son, a real son. How I wish I could have a real son. And overnight what happens? Pinocchio comes alive. And he's amazed. No strings attached. They're detached from him. Now I have a real son. And you know how the story goes? He's supposed to go to school. He jinxed school. He comes back home and he lies. And then his nose goes longer. And every time he lied, his nose gets longer and longer. And then when he finally tells the truth, it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. The point is, the puppet, which had strings, the carpenter could move him anywhere he wanted. Pinocchio, without the strings attached, is now free. He's a free thinking being. He's his own person. And he can go anywhere he wants. And he has to choose if he wants to listen to the carpenter or not. So there's some consequences there, right? I want to ask you, would the carpenter prefer Pinocchio, the real one, or the fake one? I think you know the answer. Of course the real one. But what comes with the real one is he needs freedom. He needs to be able to listen freely. Just to hammer that point, very simple example, I can see that that door's open right now. I'm going to test your, your ability to love me. So I'm going to jump out that door and I'm going to go for five minutes. And if, if I come back after five minutes and you're still here, you've passed the test. You've proven you love me. So I'll go out the door and then 10 minutes goes by and you're thinking, where is Shabal? Half an hour goes by. This is getting crazy. It's now, it's now becoming Holy Thursday and Good Friday. And you're thinking, where is he? I finally come back on Easter Sunday morning and I said, you guys are all here. You're half dead, but you're all here. You guys passed the test. You love me. And you're thinking, I didn't say this one detail. You try to get out, but the door was locked. I locked you in. And you couldn't get out. I made it all bulletproof. You couldn't get through. I made sure all the ceilings were, were, were bolted. No one could get out. You couldn't, dig it. you couldn't get through this. It was a bunker. And I came back and you were here. You passed the test and you're thinking, you're crazy. We tried to get out for three days and you couldn't let us out. You forced us to be here. But look what happens when that door stays open. Game changer. Now if I go, you're free to go. No one is actually forcing you. No one is stopping you. And you see, this is how God needed that tree of knowledge of good and evil. He needed something that allowed us to reject him. That's our forbidden fruit, the open door. So if we don't have freedom, we don't have love. That's how serious it is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know from the Old Testament, mm -hmm. all the Old Testament prophecies about what in this is saying right now, that Christ had to be crucified. He had to be killed for you, for the Old Covenant man, to make a perfect sacrifice. But to do that, Judas had to betray him. How else would he have died? Could have happened any other way. I mean... In fact, he, he didn't have to be crucified. He didn't have to. But he chose, I guess, at the time, looking at, at it, the most humiliating way to die. The one that, that, the worst of criminals, in the most embarrassing way. And, and so Jesus chose the most humiliating way to give up his life. Now, Judas didn't have to do that. But yes, okay, he did. Adam didn't have to sin, but he did. And so all these things, remember, with everything in life, whatever happens, we, God can redirect. There's always another way. There's always a, another. So if you fall off track, what happens? You put your navigator on and it redirects you. You've missed a turn, you've missed a turn, you've missed a turn. The navigator puts you back, go around the next block and you get back on track. This is what happens in life. So if it doesn't go according to, the, say, the initial plan, God still is with you and he's still guiding and you can still get back on track. So if Judas didn't do it, maybe some other way would have happened. It, it, we, but all of it does, thanks be to God, he turns all evil and all suffering into good. That's the, the story. So it doesn't matter what the devil throws at him. It doesn't matter what the devil throws at us. If we choose correctly... We can overcome evil. We can overcome sin. So we're going to fall over and over and over again. We're going to be tempted over and over and over again. 
That's, that's, I'm sorry to say, but that's life. From now to the day you die, and the more closer you get to God, guess what? The more temptations you're going to get. Get ready. That's the battle. The battle is this between spirits, the principalities of the world. And we have to choose wisely. And remember, stay humble. And when you're weak, as St. Paul says, then, then you're strong. Because it is in our weakness we lean on Jesus. And Jesus is unbreakable. Jesus is, cannot be defeated. Just when the devil thought he had him on the cross, Jesus knew what he was doing, destroyed him. And we can do the same. So we lean into our God. And with our God we can do everything. Have faith. And stay faithful to the end. Uh, great question. Maybe a, a few more? Yeah. Yes, so I'll explain. Uh, Judas, um, he wasn't really sorry, was he? He was. He 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 regretted what he did, but he didn't. He didn't. Yeah, they threw it, but he didn't say sorry, and he took matters in. He he was in despair. Worst thing he could do, and then he took his life. Peter, however, is a great alternative. Look at Peter. Remember, he said, "I will never deny you, Lord," but then he denied him like that very night, <laughs> and then. Um, he also, so he denied Jesus, and, and, then he also, and then Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan. There's a few things, and it was pretty rough on the edges. Peter was a bit rough, but Peter repented. Peter said sorry. Same comparison could be with David and Solomon in the Old Testament. Both were good kings, but both were sinners. But David repented. Solomon didn't really Maybe at the very, very end, but he didn't really repent like his father. So repentance is key. That's why Jesus' first words is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yes. So how, how are you explaining that Psalm 22? Okay. Um, is that a Catholic way of thinking, or do Protestants also um, have um, the same connection? We don't know yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I'm sure if you point it out, they would acknowledge that. But I don't know. Some, I've heard some say... Jesus is alone at that point and he feels abandoned. You've heard Christians say that? Yes, I've heard Catholics say that. But it's, it's, not, it's not the right theology. It doesn't marry up with what Jesus is doing. He's always in control. Always in control. Is there a similar quote in Isaiah as well? Yes. Actually, Isaiah prophesies that the Son of Man will be crucified. Nails in his hands and feet. It, it, Actually, how many prophecies, are, and, and this, a quarter of you I recognize that have been to Bible studies with me, how many prophecies in the Old Testament? No, that's a bit too much, but, but, but that's something else. Have a guess. It's over 300. 456 prophecies. If you are good at maths and know probability, 456 prophecies. If everyone, and all of those come true, by the way, we know who Jesus is, we know his name, we know he's born from a virgin, we know he's from the line of David, we know he'll be born in Bethlehem, we know the timing that he will be born. Remember Herod wanted to kill the firstborn two years and under? Why would he do that if he didn't, if he did, how did he know from the Old Testament? So we know all this, 456 prophecies. We know him to be the son of man who will be lifted up, David. We know he'll be crucified. We know he would rise. We know all these things about the Messiah. From the Old Testament. And then the 65,000, I will share that. Did you know, I mean, someone like Jordan Peterson, who's not even Catholic yet, I hope he will become, his wife is, but he looked at the, the Old and New Testament and realized they did a, a calculation. There are 65,000 connections between the Old and New Testament. See, the, the New Testament is <coughs> hidden in the Old, and the Old Testament is revealed in the New. 65,000 times. <laughs> Amazing. With, with those over 400 prophecies, why don't the Jews believe them? Well, so great. Why don't the Jews believe? Well, first, you need to sort of sit down with each of them and point them out and say, <laughs> Jesus fulfills them. And those who have, have converted. There's now a big movement. It's starting to happen now. Jews for Christ, and they're in Bondi. If you go to Bondi and, and you'll see there's a group of, uh, of these Jews for Christ, they practice the Jewish way, but they've accepted Jesus as the Messiah. It's done. Now, here's the other interesting 
There's 14 million Jews in the world, 2.3 billion Christians. How many, how many Jews? 14 million. 14. That's, that's it. That's not much. So I think it is working. It's just it would be nice to see the Jewish religion now is complete in Jesus and then Jesus takes it to the next level. So he is the, the, the Jewish religion, the people of the Jewish faith should be leaving the Messiah and, and so Christians is the fulfilment of Judaism. So there really shouldn't be any, don't take me out of context, but there shouldn't be any Jews today because it's fulfilled in Jesus. I think everyone is going to have to admit that Jesus is Lord because at the end of time, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord, the second coming. Yes, everyone. Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, they, whether they like it or not, we're going to see Jesus in the end. Um, all right. Well, I'm happy to hang around and, and, and thank you very much. And God bless you.